All right, next item is board planning, uh, facilities update. Yes, board. Um, what I'd like to do to start off with is again, uh, a couple weeks ago, if you remember, I was able to present a recommendation to you uh, that would involve um, building three brand new buildings and renovating four buildings. It would also involve closing four buildings and also um, uh, repurposing a fifth building. So let's just so go over that just for a minute if you don't mind. Um, why, first of all, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we have a problem. The problem is really at least twofold. Number one, we have a conditions issue with some of our buildings. We've had a, a comprehensive facility study done, as you know. Jamie Lake from Cobert Hawkins is here again, uh, to, just in case you have questions. But the conditions of several of our buildings are in such a, a position from an infrastructure perspective that we need to do that, do something to address those issues. We also have an enrollment forecast that calls for an increase in enrollment uh, because of the growth in our area over the next five to 10 years. Maybe uh, conservatively, 900 to 1,000 more students coming into our district over the next five to 10 year per period, and that's a conservative number. So you have conditions of buildings, you have enrollment issues, and currently we also have issues in our district where we have some concerns related to safety. You look at River Valley Middle School, Charlestown Middle School, open concept, North Haven Elementary, open concept buildings, no walls, no doors. We need to enclose those buildings to make them safer. It's also not a good learning environment for kids in those buildings because there are distractions. You can hear what's going on in other rooms. I've been in those buildings, I've experienced it myself, and we need to do something about that. So that's really a top priority. In Charlestown, we have the growth issues. You have a Pleasant Ridge and Jonathan Jennings, both <coughs> buildings are in need of major renovation or repair. So the recommendation is that we build a brand new building off of 403 between Salem Noble and Bethany. Um, and we close the current Pleasant Ridge. And why would we do that? Because we can't expand Pleasant Ridge on its current location. It only has eight acres. We can't grow that building out. It's landlocked. So we close that building. What's another reason why we need it? Well, Charlestown High School will be projected to grow over time. Currently, if we grow Charlestown High School, from Charlestown High School to the football field is where the growth would have to occur. That's the design. If you, if you expand that building, it would occur between the building and the football stadium. What's there? A football practice area that really is not of high quality to begin with. And we have tennis courts that spend time being underwater because of where they're positioned. So we need to have a place to allow for expansion of the Charleston High School building eventually and then move athletic facilities over to that Pleasant Ridge site. If you come down into Jeffersonville, the three buildings that are in the worst shape are Maple, Spring Hill, and TJ. We love all those buildings. We love the kids in all those buildings. We care a great deal about them. It's not about them. It's about the buildings they're in. We have a problem with the lack of equity in our facilities. It's not fair that we have students in those buildings who attend those schools every day, overcoming the mechanical elements of those buildings, when we have other st students who are fortunate enough to go to a Riverside, a Utica, a New Washington Elementary. Those three buildings are in excellent shape. We need to have equity in our facilities. So what we would do is we would uh, close Maple. We'd move the student population to Parkview Middle School. We'd renovate Parkview Middle School. It's on 12 acres of land, not big enough for a, a middle school, truly. It's landlocked. We would bring the Bridgepoint population also down to Parkview. The combination would be roughly around a 610, 620, which is still a manageable size. Bridgepoint Elementary, the building would stay open. We would repurpose it. We've got a tremendous program, as you know, at Cordon Porter, Clark County Middle High, but one of the problems we have is not enough space for those kids. We need to be able to have more space to, to expand those programs because they're two of the best programs in the state of Indiana. So that's what we do at Bridgepoint. Um, you would then, coming up to the east side of 10th Street, you have Parkview that would become a elementary. We can name it Parkview. You could name it whatever. We could get those two buildings to work on that. That's fine. 
but along with Riverside and also um, Utica, they would feed into a new middle school. Now we started to look at where would that new middle school be? We want it east of 10th Street. So it's clear, right now we have students at Utica, Wilson, and North Haven. Some fifth graders go to River Valley and some go to Parkview. We want it very clear that if you go to those elementaries, you will end up going to the new Jefferson Middle School. There's land up around this area. We'd probably need about 30 acres. We would secure that, we'd build a brand new middle school. Remember, all of our growth is projected to come in northern Jeffersonville up through Charlestown. So this middle school would be strategically placed to accommodate that. On the other side of 10th Street, Spring Hill, a building 1967, a lot of issues. Three split section classrooms. What are those? That's a teacher that's teaching at least two grade levels. We have three of those. That's unfair to those students at Spring Hill. We cannot have that, and that's not what's educationally sound. We move the population up to North Haven. We renovate North Haven. There's land to do it. We can make that happen. So we merge those populations. TJ, closed, landlocked, can't expand. There's nothing else that we can do with that building on that site. So we move uh, the population. We build a brand new uh, elementary on the Wilson Elementary site, brand new. The Wilson population currently would go into this building and the majority of the TJ population would go there as well. We may need to look at the population there depending upon how we might have to redistrict. We may have to send some of the TJ population to the new North Haven. Again, those buildings can have their own names. River Valley would be renovated. So now you have uh, North Haven, Parkwood, and a new building on the Wilson property all feeding into the River Valley. Three elementaries to the east, three elementaries to the west, all feeding middle schools, one on the east, one on the west. So this is a 20-month process of study. Uh, it's a $119 million proposal. And what I'd like to also share with you tonight is $119 million sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But our kids are worth it. And we need to make an investment in our community. Our kids are our most important asset. The future of our community is going to be dependent upon our students, and they deserve the best facilities we can provide for them. You know, a lot of school districts, when they do their planning for buildings, they develop a long-term plan, and over time, they're able to modify or upgrade their buildings. That didn't happen in Greater Clark. All of our buildings are all at a point where they all need work. The high schools five years ago, they all needed major work. A hundred million dollars was poured into those three high schools at the time, and that, and still we have half of Jeff High that was never touched. And so we've got to start putting money into these buildings, or else uh, we're going to put ourselves really behind the eight ball. So what's the cost factor to the individual taxpayer? Well, this, this just gives you a sense of what would happen with our debt service over a period of time. The key factor that you would see in 2016 is there would be a roughly a 13, almost 14 cent increase in the tax rate. Um, what I, I think is important to note here, now this is based upon schools, the impact, the tax impact related to a person's tax bill. This is the school aspect of it. So the 13 cents, let's talk about that for a minute. In 2014, our overall tax rate was $1.06. The assessed valuation of this Greater Clark County Schools, our, our property area values, uh, increased by $60 million in 2015. It's the first time the assessed valuation went up, I believe, in five years. What that did is that dropped the tax rate to $0.93. Cents. So that can be viewed for the individual taxpayer as a good thing. This building project would put the same tax rate, would take us right back up to about that $1.06 It'd be about the same level in 2016 as it was in 2014. I think that's good news. I think that's exciting. I know we're talking about a lot of money, but that rate is pretty exciting. Now let's go to an individual taxpayer. All right. <clears throat> the median priced home in Greater Clark, looking at all the homes in the Greater Clark County Schools, the median value, of course that means that there are just as many 
uh, homes valued above 124.5 as there are below, right in the middle. That's the median average, is 124.5. So if I own that home, my tax bill would be $66.88 greater in 2016 than compared to 2015. That can be broken down by 557 per month is the cost to the taxpayer of that homeowner. If I own a $200,000 home, you can see it's an additional $134 for the year, which is broken down to $11.19 a month. So I think that it's really vital that our community understands that we're trying to be very sensitive to our taxpayers. But there has to be a balance. You, if you want to make sure that you are securing the future of our students, you have quality buildings. These aren't Taj Mahals. These are quality buildings that can last for another 50 years. Then it's going to cost something. It's an investment, though. I can't think of a better way to invest your money than in our kids. So if I'm that medium-priced homeowner, it's going to cost me $5 and $57 more per week. $67 less than uh, for the year. And I think that's pretty significant. I think that's exciting. I think that that's more reasonable than some people may have thought it would be. We have a lot of education to do, um, but I'm prepared to do the work. And I'm prepared to go out, as you know, board, uh, with your authorization and as your representative to do the work necessary to make sure if we have to go door to door, speak to every group, that we'll go ahead and we'll break this down for eventually we'll have a calculator for each and every homeowner. They can go in, they can figure out, here's the AV of my household, what will that do to my tax bill? And remember, a tax bill is made up of uh, taxes that come from many different entities. A, a large portion of that tax bill is going to our school system. So I think it's important to note that whatever I would be paying on my tax bill for 2015, if I'm that medium price homeowner, and if nothing else changes, nothing else changes other than this building project, I can expect to pay $67 in more in 2016 than I did in 2015. Um, so I think that that's good news moving forward. What about time frame? Board, as you know, I've been out. Renee's been great. She's been scheduling me. I've been talking to staffs. I've been talking to parent groups. I'm going to continue to do that. I'll be talking to other community groups over the course of the next month. We're surveying, the, we'll begin surveying the community to get their thoughts and their input and feedback. This is all about information gathering. It would be my hope that through gathering all that information that we might be able to bring to you by mid-June a, um, a recommendation to move forward. It'd be in the form of what's called a 1028 hearing, uh, open to the public, where we would finalize our recommendation to you. Right now, it's simply my recommendation, um, but we, we, we've been soliciting input and feedback, and we need to, if it needs to be modified and improvised in, uh, in some way, then we'll do what, whatever it takes. But that would be the goal. I don't know if you have questions or comments. I know you've had a little bit of time to process through, but is there anything in particular that I can be addressing for you at this point? Well, I've got a, I just jotted something down. As it stands right now, can, can every elementary student in Greater Clark take all the related art classes, uh, music, band, PE, and all that on a daily basis or as they can't, right? Right now, there are concerns with some of our smaller elementaries. We try to provide a level of music, art, and PE to all students, but how that's being delivered is different at each and every elementary. By having buildings that are slightly larger than we currently have them, we will be able to have a uh, more comprehensive art, music, and PE program in every elementary, in addition to preschools, English language learner programs, emotionally disabled student programs, and uh, severe and profound programs. Right now, we have a lot of students in those ELL and special ed areas we have to bus to other schools. So even though they may live 
in one community, in one specific uh, community, they have to be bused to another school. That's not right. That's not fair. That's not equitable. We need to change that. So it, uh, it's a good question that you're asking because we're making sure that we're, we have comprehensive elementary programs in every school. We're cognizant of size. Remember, the average size of an elementary in Indiana is 580 students. Our largest elementary is Parkwood at 570. So even our largest elementary is slightly less than the average size in Indiana. So our community is, is used to a certain size of elementary, but when we build these schools, the goal is to build them in such a way that you basically have a primary, which is your pre-K through grade two, and an intermediate wing uh, in the building. That's three through five. And at an elementary level, I know I have three children. At the elementary level, what's that key relationship? It's between the teacher and the students in their classroom. Whether I'm, uh, if we have a 25 to one student to teacher ratio in our elementaries, whether I'm in a 370 student elementary or I'm in a 570 student elementary, I still, as a teacher, I have 25 students. And that relationship between those students and the teacher is the key. So I think people, um, I can understand their sensitivity to size, but we think we've found the right balance. These elementaries are not so large that kids will get lost in the shuffle, but they're large enough in order to make sure that we have a comprehensive level of programming in each one and still have a personal touch and relationship between teachers and staff and students. Thank you. Dr. Millen, just one question. Can you walk us through what redistricting might look like? I mean, obviously that's gonna be part of this program or this project. So can you sort of walk us through how that would happen? Sure, you know, one of the things that would happen because, you know, we're merging in some cases, uh, like in the Maple and Bridgepoint circumstance, you're merging those two schools into one. Uh, but what you would have to do is you'd have to really talk about what does that district look like because we wanna make sure we keep manageable school sizes. So we have to look at that. Riverside could accommodate some more students. Utica can accommodate some more students. So if we have to look and make sure that our, our sizes are manageable and reasonable, then what we'd be doing is moving our district slightly around to make sure that the school sizes stayed manageable. Um, that would be true on the other side of, of 10th Street as well, is that we would have to look at moving populations to the north, and frankly, we have to start looking at in northern Jeffersonville, we have a whole population that lives north of Jeffersonville, south of Charlestown, and some of those individuals come to Utica and really um, probably should be going up into Charlestown. We have to look at our district boundaries. We may have to move our boundary so that more students in certain locations <coughs> north of Jeffersonville would be going up into Charlestown. And we have to talk about our new Washington families. You know, we have to look at the Charlestown district and we have to see north of Charlestown, does that district have to be slightly modified in order to get more students up into New Washington? So this plan, in my opinion, will positively impact every student in Greater Clark. And so if that helps with the redistricting, we're gonna have to look and manage um, where kids are moving because we wanna be respectful of their neighborhoods. If their neighborhood was this big, now their neighborhood may be this big. But we, we, the one thing that we want to be careful of is that they still feel the sense of neighborhood. That's going to be important. And I think we can make that happen with some minor adjustments in terms of how we would redistrict. Not major adjustments, but minor. Okay, so follow-up question on that is, do, would you anticipate that being all laid out prior to this going to referendum? Or would this be something that you would have to think about after um, you know, the referendum is approved? I would, I, I probably could start to do some preliminary um, planning in that regard. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to do that board if that's what you'd like me to do. I think it's important though that, um, you know, we make sure that, I, I think it's very vital. It's sort of like the numbers, the financial numbers we put up there. Yeah. People in our community expect those to be rock solid accurate. That's why we didn't bring them out to you until tonight. 
We have a financial team of experts. They've evaluated and reviewed it, and those numbers are solid. I want to make sure I don't, I, I don't want to present some numbers to you too prematurely in terms of redistricting, and then people hold us to it later. So I just want to be careful with that board moving forward. So it would be sort of a, a best guess prior to that. I mean, because I can anticipate we will probably get those type questions yes. um, as we begin to locate these new schools. Okay, where, where am I going to go? Right. So, okay. Be happy to put something together. All right. Did, did you say we were going to try to have preschool in every building? Right. In fact, uh, next year, we are going to have a preschool in every building, but we've had to move some things around in order to find the room to make that happen. We had seven preschools in our 12, of our 12 elementaries this year. We had seven of those elementaries that had a preschool. Next year, we found some grant funding to bring in a, a preschool into the other five. But the problem we're having is we've, we, we have some buildings that are already at capacity where we're going to have to modify. For example, let me tell you another thing that happens. And board, I may be telling you more than you want to know, but I, I hope this is helpful. You know, in some of our buildings, you have what's called music or art on a cart. There's not a, there's not a set music room that kids go to or an art room that kids go to. So what happens is that the art teacher or music teacher have a, have a cart right. and they have to cart the, that, uh, the cart down to a, a specific classroom. So they have to actually provide that instruction in a regular classroom. Well, that is possible. Our teachers are highly capable and cope and adapt easily, and so do our kids. But in a more comprehensive elementary, there's a designated room that's that teacher's home that can be set up, whether it's for art or it's music. Just like a gymnasium is set up for a PE teacher, you have to have a special place for art and music. That's not happening currently uh, the way we have things set up. So I believe that if you look at art, music, and PE, those are also very important to all of our students in our school system. They also deserve to have that kind of high level of quality and proper facility equitably across all of our schools. That may have been more than you wanted to know, but I will tell you that the great fortune I've had is to be in every one of our buildings multiple times a year. I, I see what's happening. I see our people overcoming our facilities. Keep in mind, our maintenance people and custodians are doing a great job. But when things start to break down, it becomes tougher and tougher to keep them up to speed. And that's where we are in several of our buildings in our district. We need to take action, and we need to take action fairly quickly. Did I understand you to say, and, and I know that the, the impact on the tax rate is going to be one of the big issues, so I want to make sure I understand this we will have a calculator on our website eventually where a person will be able to put their, take their tax bill, look at the assessed valuation, which is not necessarily what I would sell my house for. Right. Um, but you put that in and it would actually give us an estimated tax increase. For right. This person. Okay. Yeah, we'll I make think that will be very helpful. Well, and I think that as we move forward on this board, I mean, The financial component of this, I, I've always believed in balance. Everything in life, there should be a balance. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the education of our kids and the cost to provide the kind of quality education that we believe our community deserve, you know, our community believes those kids deserve. Okay, so what does that mean? We have to find the right balance. There's no such thing as a free lunch. We, we have to be willing to pay and invest in order to make this happen. So we have to find that correct tipping point. What is the right number? Obviously, all of us would prefer just to have brand new uh, renovated or brand new facilities and not have to pay for them. Well, that's not a realistic endeavor. If you want something in this life, you are going to have to pay for it. But I think it's important that I know you believe this, and I believe it, that I know our taxpayers in this area. I know our citizens. And I know we've got to be sensitive to the cost. So we've got to find the right. And I think that we have found something it, that is a reasonable project in terms of its overall cost and its impact on our citizens. 
I don't know if I should admit this out loud. <clears throat> I calculated mine, and I spend that much at Starbucks every year. <laughs> well, that's, you know, when you break it down to a weekly cost, yeah. and you just think about what we spend money on, I just think it needs, we need to be respectful of all of our citizens and, and the diversity that we have in terms of our socioeconomic status in our community. We have um, a lot of citizens that have already, you know, has sent their children through schools, maybe have grandchildren in schools. I mean, we need to be very considerate of all of our citizens. <laughs> but I think that all of our citizens who have chosen to live in Greater Clark they all would want to have the best quality of community that they can have. And I'll say it again, they're gonna finish this East End Bridge, which is an unbelievable thing. We have businesses moving into uh, River Ridge and in other parts of, of our school system. That's awesome. If, but if we're not careful, as the people come, if we don't have the homes, the quality of life issues, the schools, then they will look to live elsewhere. And that bridge will become a convenient way for them to live elsewhere and to work here. Just like 265 will make it convenient for people to live elsewhere and work here. Do we want to be the school system where people work and don't choose to live? I didn't come here as a superintendent of Greater Clark County Schools and bring my three children with that in mind. And I'm gonna bet that we have a lot of people in our community that will buy into that same thing. This is not unreasonable, this is needed. Whether you pay now, we can pay now, or we can pay a heck of a lot more later, because at some point, these buildings need to be replaced. They're at that point. So let's get out ahead of it, be proactive, and not have to be reactive. That's what I hope that people will buy into. Further questions for Dr. Mellon? Well, Dr. Mellon, thank you for the summary. I mean, I, I think you've got a responsibility to paint as accurate a picture of our buildings as we can. I think it's our responsibility to balance that with what the tax impact's going to be. And I think we've gotten some really good information now to take that back and begin to think through that. So, you know, compliments to you, compliments to um, Mr. Lake for the, for the work he's done. And, um, I, I just appreciate it. So you're welcome. It's been a lot to it, and your work's just beginning. So um, thank you. I know that. <laughs> yeah.